This is lesson 1916, the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, and the last of our French Revolution lessons. How did a slave revolt on colonial Saint-Domingue lead to the creation of the independent nation of Haiti in 1804? College Board Topic 5.5, The French Revolution's Effects. Explain how the events and developments of the French Revolution influenced political and social ideas from 1648 to 1815. Well, revolutionary ideals inspired a slave revolt led by Toussaint Louverture in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which became the independent nation of Haiti in 1804. Places, of course, Saint-Domingue, also known as Haiti, Time frame, 1791 to 1805. Key people of the Haitian Revolution, Toussaint Louverture, Francois Thomas Galbo, Léger Félicité Santonax, Daddy Bouquemont, and Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Introduction. The French Revolution exposed deep divisions in French colonial society. The French Revolution unleashed the largest slave revolt in history. It led to the separation of France's most important colony, Saint-Domingue, from France. It led to the creation of modern Haiti, the only nation in history to claim its freedom through a slave revolt, only the second independent country in the Western Hemisphere, and the first independent country in Latin America. The French Revolution was, of course, big news in Saint-Domingue. Your expectations of it, both good and bad, depended on your status in colonial society and these varying expectations often conflicted. In the wake of the brutal execution of Vincent Auger from Lesson 1907, the National Assembly back in France had granted certain free people of color, as we saw, full citizenship back in May of 1791. Many white people, right up to the governor of Saint-Domingue, simply refused to put this new law into effect. When you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like tyranny to you. White merchants and planters in Saint-Domingue were hoping that the French Revolution would mean more economic and political autonomy from France. Some even hoped it would be a chance for Saint-Domingue to break away from French rule entirely. The Americans had done that with Britain. Poor whites and artisans in Saint-Domingue were hoping that the French Revolution would actually expand their privileges and opportunities at the expense of free people of color, whom they resented for the success that they saw many of them having. Slave owners were worried about how their slaves would respond to all this news about revolution and freedom and rights and equal citizenship. There were only about 30,000 whites and about 500,000 slaves in Saint-Domingue. Plantation owners had calculated long ago that it was more cost-effective to starve and work slaves to death and then purchase more than it was to take care of the needs of the ones you already had. In 1783, one plantation owner described the social instability in Saint-Domingue this way. A slave colony is like a city under attack. We are treading on powder kegs. Saint-Domingue was supplying half the world's sugar. It also exported huge amounts of coffee, cotton, hardwood, and indigo. In 1788, exports from Saint-Domingue exceeded everything produced in the entire United States. Slaves had high expectations of the French Revolution. The French Revolution reinforced rumors of better treatment and liberty. Slaves had already heard rumors about British abolition. They heard rumors of the Spanish right next door in Santo Domingo easing up the amount of work they made their slaves do. A revolt in Martinique had broken out when a rumor went around that the King of France had freed the slaves. The governor of the French colony of Guadeloupe decreed that any slave wearing the tricolor cockade would be whipped in the public square. Many plantation owners advised against showing the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen anywhere. When the outbreak finally came, it was well-planned, organized, massive, and fast-moving. In August 1791, 2,000 slaves gathered in northern Saint-Domingue and started moving from plantation to plantation, leaving a path of destruction in their wake, setting sugarcane on fire, smashing sugar mills, killing white planters. Within a few days, they numbered 10,000. Most whites fled to the former capital of La Cap. 
Within two weeks, 23 of the 27 parishes of the northern province were in full revolt. 200 sugar plantations had been destroyed. 1,200 coffee estates had been destroyed. By late September, there were at least 20,000 rebels. The revolt was not spontaneous. Its leaders had been planning it for weeks. Many of these leaders had been high-ranking slaves in positions of authority over other slaves. Duddy Bukman was a religious leader who gave the rebellion a religious aspect. He may have launched the rebellion with a voodoo sacrificial ceremony in which he's recorded to have said, Throw away the image of the God of whites who thirsts for our tears and listen to the voice of liberty that is in the ears of all of us. These words were carefully chosen to inspire. Our gods can't be stopped by a mere image of a god. If our real gods are on our side, who can stop us with their false god? And instead of listening to a false god, listen to the voice of liberty. And when the French killed Bukman in November 1791, they burned his body and publicly displayed his head in order to undermine the religious fervor of the revolt. The revolt was carefully organized. Many slaves had military training, even from Africa. They used guerrilla tactics because they had fewer weapons than the French. Because they were less well-armed, they could not attack the coastal towns. Casualties among the rebels were much higher than among the French. About 400 French were killed, but about 4,000 rebels were killed and another 4,000 were captured. A stalemate set in between the rebels and the French. Slaves held the interior of the colony. They converted plantations into camps for growing food staples instead of cash crops. You can't live on sugar and coffee. Whites held up in the coastal towns and waited for reinforcements from France. Toussaint Louverture emerged as a prominent rebel leader. He was a complex person. He had been born in Africa. He had been taken to Saint-Domingue as a slave. He was a devout Catholic, not voodoo. He had learned to read and write. He was granted his freedom, and he then rented a coffee plantation. He even owned a few slaves himself. His coffee enterprise failed, and when the rebellion broke out, he was working as a paid freeman on the very same plantation he had worked on as a slave. Even though he was free, his wife and children were still slaves. His original name was Toussaint Breda, named after the plantation that he had been a slave on. And he took the name Louverture, and that's French for opening. Perhaps he considered himself the opening of a new era of liberty and equality for the slaves of Saint-Domingue. The French response to the revolt. Within months, Parisian women were rioting in the streets over the high price of sugar. Sugar was an ingredient in just about every type of food you could imagine in France, so this was a major problem. So, in April 1792, the National Assembly and the King granted full citizenship and political rights without condition to all free people of color. They thought that this would end the rebellion because then free people of color would side with the whites against the slaves. The National Assembly was not about to abolish slavery yet. In the summer of 1792, France sent troops and commissioners to restore order in Saint-Domingue. And the two main commissioners were Légère Félicité Sontanax and Étienne Polverel. Politically, they were both abolitionists and they had three jobs. Number one, restore order. Number two, put full citizenship and rights for free people of color in place. And number three, crush the slave revolt and restore slavery. Sontanax and Paul Varel had no end of trouble trying to accomplish this mission. They forged alliances with free people of color, and this was supposed to be the path for defeating the slave revolt, but it also caused white planters not to trust them. The commissioners won military battles against the insurgents, but then the enemy would just go into the mountains where they could not be reached. In 1793, King Louis XVI was executed, as we know, and France was at war with basically everyone else in Europe. And this made Saint-Domingue a tempting target for France's British and Spanish enemies. 
The Spanish, on the other side of the island of Hispaniola, in their colony of Santo Domingo, began recruiting rebel slaves into their own army. They promised freedom and land in exchange for military service. Toussaint Louverture became one of those Spanish recruits and rose to prominence for the Spanish. Saltanax and Paul Varel urged the National Convention in France, it had become the National Convention by this time, to abolish slavery. Saltanax argued that the French army in Europe and the slaves in Saint-Domingue were fighting for the same thing, freedom and equality. But the National Convention did nothing. French planters who had fled to London and Jamaica urged the British government to attack Saint-Domingue. They wanted the British to restore their slaveholding way of life. The turning point of the revolution. This was the defining moment in the fate of the nation of Haiti. In May 1793, a new governor arrived in Saint-Domingue named François-Thomas Galbo. He was the exact opposite of the commissioners, Santanax and Paul Varel. He refused to enact or obey the National Assembly's April 1792 law giving free people of color equal rights and citizenship. He also recently inherited property in Saint-Domingue, which disqualified him from remaining governor due to a conflict of interest. And he sided with the whites against these two commissioners. So Santo Knox and Paul Varel demanded Galbo's resignation as governor. And when Galbo refused, they arrested him and put him on a ship that was set to sail to France so that he could explain his actions to the National Convention. And while Galbo was still on the ship in the harbor in the town of Le Cap, the white planters asked him to lead an insurgence against Sontanax and Paul Varel. So Galbo put together an insurrection of 3,000 men from the ships in the harbor, and they invaded and plundered the city of Le Cap on June 20th, 1793. The commissioners had to flee Le Cap. In order to take the city back from Galbo's insurgents, Sontanax and Paul Varel declared that they would grant freedom to any who fought for France. They got 2,000 rebel slaves to come down from the hills and join their side against Galbo, and that was enough to take back the city. Galbo and his men fled back to their ships and sailed for the United States, leaving the city in flames and chaos. When Galbo finally made it back to France, he was thrown into prison for eight months as a suspected royalist. Later, he worked for the Committee of Public Safety. In July 1793, Sontanax and Paul Varel extended their decree to include the wives and children of all slaves who fought for France. And finally, you see this is going in stages, from August to October 1793, after receiving a petition from the slaves that quoted from the Declaration of the Rights of Man, the commissioners emancipated and gave citizenship to everyone in the entire colony of Saint-Domingue, whether they fought for France or not. Former slaves were still required to work on the plantations upon which they had been slaves for one year, but at least they would be paid. In February 1794, the National Convention in France ratified the commissioner's abolition of slavery, and extended it to all French colonies. Toussaint Louverture was cautious and suspicious at first. He did not trust these commissioners. He felt that they had overstepped their authority with their abolition of slavery. He also did not think that republics were stable enough to protect freedom and equality. He preferred to serve under the protection of the Spanish king. But meanwhile, the British were invading both Saint-Domingue's northern and southern provinces, restoring slavery wherever they went. Toussaint Louverture waited until May of 1794 to switch sides and return to the French after the National Convention had ratified Saltanax and Paul Varel's actions. Toussaint Louverture's joining the French tipped the balance in France's favor militarily against the British. He brought 4,000 troops with him. Toussaint Louverture's dominance. Over the next six years, Louverture extended his control over the entire island of Hispaniola. He annexed the Spanish side of the island. He kicked the British off the island. 
In order to get the economy moving, he reestablished the plantation system, but with paid labor, and he maintained a large army. He defeated other leaders who wanted to control the colony. Toussaint Louverture instituted a constitution that named him Governor General for life. He established Catholicism as the official religion of Saint Domingue, and he also acknowledged Saint Domingue's status as a French colony. In other words, we will remain French as long as France acknowledges and respects our freedom. However, in 1802, Napoleon sent his brother-in-law to re-establish slavery in Saint-Domingue. His brother-in-law arrested Toussaint Louverture and sent him to prison in France where Louverture died of pneumonia and tuberculosis. Meanwhile, Napoleon's forces on Saint-Domingue were so decimated by yellow fever that they had to give up and leave Saint-Domingue in 1803. Toussaint Louverture's successor, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, declared Saint-Domingue to be the independent nation of Haiti on January 1st, 1804. The Significance of the Haitian Revolution One third of the population was killed in the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution was a nightmare scenario for slave-holding societies all over the Western Hemisphere. To placate slave owners in the United States, Thomas Jefferson refused to acknowledge Haiti as an independent nation. Think about that. The first independent nation in the Western Hemisphere refusing to acknowledge the second independent nation in the Western Hemisphere. The United States did not recognize Haiti as an independent nation until 1862. But we continued to trade with Haiti under very unfair trade policies. France placed a 150 million gold piece indemnity charge on Haiti. This was to compensate France for the loss of French property. Haiti had to pay it in order to receive diplomatic recognition. This was eventually reduced to 90 million gold pieces. But Haiti didn't get it paid off until mid-20th century, and this crippled the Haitian economy for many decades. But the most significant thing about the Haitian Revolution was this. The values of the French Revolution... Liberty, equality, fraternity, citizenship, political rights, and individual rights were now firmly established as being for everyone. Not just French people, not just white people. All people, regardless of color or origin or social status, were entitled to what was promised in the Declaration of the Rights of man and citizen. <laughs>